David, thank you very much for uh, accepting this interview. It's a pleasure to meet with you here in Brighton uh, to discuss uh, not only about transhumanism but particularly particularly about your philosophy. You know, and uh, before we begin the, this conversation, could you please introduce yourself to to my audience? Well, yes, I'm British. I'm a third generation vegan vegetarian. Uh, in 1995, I wrote an online manifesto called The Hedonistic Imperative, which, in spite of its rather debauched title, is a plea to use biotechnology to phase out suffering, not merely in humans, but throughout the living world, and to replace today's misery and malaise with uh, gradients of genetically pre-programmed bliss. Um, with the long-term goal of creating a civilization based on the three supers. That's super happiness, super longevity, and super intelligence. Mm -hmm. So basically you're providing the three main tenets of transhumanism. So yes. what is transhumanism? Um, transhumanism is an incredibly broad and diverse movement, but yeah, one can identify distinct strands. Uh, transhumanists believe in using technology to overcome our biological limitations. And I mentioned the three, the, the three supers. Let's, let's just briefly run through them. And super longevity. This is the idea that just as silicon robots, for example, can be repaired and upgraded indefinitely, there is no immutable law of nature that says that organic robots, biological robots like us, uh, must grow old, crumble away and die. And that if we're prepared to tackle the biology of aging, it's going to be possible to lead indefinite lifespans. Now, I think a lot of people hearing uh, this will have rather mixed feelings in that increasingly science recognizes that at some time in future we can maybe be able to phase out aging but most if not all of the people listening to this now will probably grow old and die so transhumanists also advocate as well as tackling the biology of aging cryonics and in some cases even cryothanasia this is the idea that if you sign up to have yourself uh, 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 frozen, suspended, uh, that at some future date it would be possible to reanimate you, curing whatever killed you, and uh, also uh, upgrading and, res and uh, restoring you. So long as information is preserved, then in theory at any rate it should be possible to reanimate you. So anyway, that's one strand of transhumanism, super longevity. Mm -hmm. Superintelligence. Superintelligence is uh, the idea that rather than being the culmination of, of evolution, that humans are uh, transitional, that our descendants uh, will think anyone uh, alive today, even the greatest super genius of our age, uh, is effectively very simple minded. And so transhumanists believe in ra radically augmenting uh, our intellectual, emotional, empathetic, maybe even spiritual mm -hmm. uh, uh, capacities. So people like Einstein would be like the dumbest in their class. Oh, indeed, like the like like, like the village idiot. Newton yes. would be like a marginal intelligent. Yes, yes. by those standards yes. that you're aiming. Yes. Um, but I think we sh uh, transhumanists uh, believe in a much richer conception of intelligence and superintelligence than the kind of simple-minded IQ test. One shouldn't mm -hmm. simply imagine superintelligence as some kind of off-the-scale IQ. Emotional um, intelligence. Also. Emotional intelligence, social cognition, mind-reading skills, mm -hmm. uh, increased sensory capacities. In fairness, there are radically different conceptions of what superintelligence entails. Mm -hmm. um, there is the particular conception that I envisage in which superintelligence is essentially going to be our massively genetically enriched biological descendants, augmented by artificial intelligence, but still nonetheless biological. I think for technical reasons I'm quite sceptical, for example, that classical digital computers are ever going to become conscious. Mm -hmm. But there are other conceptions of 
super intelligence uh, expounded by for example Ray Kurzweil that envisage a complete fusion between humans and our machines yes. maybe even uh, mind loading and not in not in some distant uh, future but possibly even later this century the so-called singularity mm -hmm. but as well as shall we say the the biological superintelligence and the Kurzweilian conception there is a third conception of superintelligence very crudely the so-called intelligence explosion that envisage is that superintelligence may not be biological at all it may be our intelligent machines mm -hmm. which one already sees how our computers are comprehensively outperforming us in so many cognitive domains from chess to medical diagnosis mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and uh, some transhumanists envisage uh, a uh, intelligence explosion which is a combination of Moore's law i.e. the exponential growth mm -hmm. of computer processing power together and this is really critical with this idea of recursively self-improving software-based AI leading mm -hmm. to a runaway... Self-learning. Yeah, a, 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 some kind of runaway... Uh, uh, yeah, uh, uh, some, some kind of chain reaction that could happen very rapidly indeed. Mm -hmm. um, it's, a, it's a conception of post-human superintelligence originally propagated by a mathematician IG Good, but developed by uh, Elisia Yukowski, mm -hmm. Miri Machine Intelligence Research Institute, and uh, dealt with comprehensively by Nick Bostrom in his magisterial book Superintelligence. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's three conceptions of, of, of superintelligence. But there's a third super, and this is where I've focused, spent a lot of my time, a lot of my work. This is, this is uh, in some ways, it's quite darker, or at least its theme is quite darker, is that life on Earth today is stained by appalling suffering, human, non-human suffering, uh, something like 850,000 people each year take their own lives, hundreds of millions of people are depressed, millions of people have chronic pain disorders, millions of non-human animals suffer and die in factory farms and the wild. Mm -hmm. um, but thanks to biotechnology and I would hope social, social, social reform, mm -hmm. it essentially is going to be possible to phase out the biology of suffering altogether mm -hmm. and replace it by gradients of intelligent bliss. Mm -hmm. Perhaps I should just clarify, there's this term, the hedonic treadmill. Yes. The idea that each of us has a set of negative feedback mechanisms in the brain that stop most of us being very happy or very unhappy for very long and mm -hmm. it's extremely genetically adaptive certainly in the ancestral environment to have this suite of negative feedback mechanisms and it explains the so-called lottery paradox uh, that you might imagine that Winning the lottery would yeah, make you incredibly happy for the rest of your life or becoming uh, quadriplegic in a, in a terrible accident would lead to chronic depression. But on average, and there are complications, but on average, six months after either winning the lottery uh, or becoming quadriplegic in a terrible accident, most people will have reverted to their previous level of well-being or ill-being before the win or the tragedy. And in less dramatic guys, one can see this across the, across the world today, that on average, most people are neither more nor less happy stroke unhappy than our ancestors on the African savannah. That other mm -hmm. things being equal, discontent, anxiety, even in certain circumstances, depression can be genetically adaptive. Mm -hmm. And if we are to get rid of the biology of involuntary pain and suffering, we need to tackle its biological genetic roots. Mm -hmm. And thanks to revolution in biotechnology, in particular CRISPR genome ed editing, you mm -hmm. probably followed the controversy yeah, yeah. over the first design of babies, mm -hmm. essentially it's going to be possible to change human nature and even to genetically reprogram the biosphere mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and yes this is the the third super which can be summarized in super happiness mm -hmm. um, but that can sound rather one-dimensional and crass i suspect the 
well-being of our descendants will be yeah far richer than anything even physiologically mm -hmm. conceivable today. So you call this the the abolitionist project, the end of suffering, the abolitionist project, and you go through what you call the hedonistic imperative. Yes, I mean there's a distinction between getting rid of suffering mm -hmm. and the theoretical possibility of eventually ratcheting up a hedonic range. If, if, if crudely and schematically today's hedonic range is minus 10 for terrible agony and despair, zero is uh, the, kind of th the watershed, neutral mm -hmm. experience, hedonic zero, and plus 10 is your most sublime peak experience. Um, in principle, thanks to our understanding of our reward circuitry, it should be possible to ratchet up hedonic range hedonic set points such that, and this is much further into the future, one could imagine a civilization that is, say, plus 70 to uh, plus 100 or plus 90 mm -hmm. to a plus 100. Mm -hmm. um, that is much more, more, more distant. Um, I think it's very important to stress gradients, gradients of, of, of well-being. It's not a case of getting blissed out, that by ratcheting up hedonic set points. It means that you can preserve your existing values and preferences for mm -hmm. the most part. It's mm -hmm. not asking you to sacrifice your values and preferences on the altar of someone else's version of paradise. Mm -hmm. um, and by preserving informational sensitivity, to use a bit of jargon, to good, uh, to good and bad stimuli, mm -hmm. um, it's possible to retain critical insight social responsibility, intellectual progress. So there is a slogan one can talk about. Yes, mm -hmm. lifelong happiness, even super happiness. Uh, it's intelligent uh, mm -hmm. happiness, intelligent well-being. So from a philosophical point of view, this would uh, be labeled as negative utilitarianism. That's, do you think that's correct? Yes, I mean, if one is a negative utilitarian... So negative utilitarians basically say, uh, let's avoid pain and suffering. Yeah. That's, that's the main tenet. Yeah. So yeah. if you can develop that idea. Yes, I mean, in some ways, negative utilitarianism is rather, obviously, a very unappealing brand, but it's essentially the secular equivalent of Buddhism. I mean, Buddha mm -hmm. said, you know, I teach one thing, one thing only, suffering and the end of suffering. Mm -hmm. um, no one, as far as we knew, as we know, told Buddha, so you'd destroy the world if you could, that would end suffering. Mm -hmm. um, by contrast, if you say you're a negative utilitarian, that's the kind of response you get. But uh, no, the world has no off switch. Yes, we could simply get rid of, of suffering and not care about uh, creating rich, diverse, flourishing lifestyle, just make sure no one suffered. But uh, one thing about being a negative utilitarian is that you want to abolish any form of, of disappointment. And most mm -hmm. people would be very disappointed if they weren't able to, to flourish mm -hmm. uh, maximally and if their families to flourish too. So, uh, although ethically I might think it optional ratcheting up uh, hedonic range into the uh, yeah, the unbelievable kind of paradise that I think uh, uh, awaits us. Uh, yeah, as a negative mm -hmm. utilitarian, uh, one is allowed to say this. So hedonism, hedonism is associated to pleasure. Yeah. It's uh, what kind? Because the question here would be, are uh, pleasure and happiness the same? If if they are not the same, how does uh, pleasure fill all the holes of of happiness? Mm. Sometimes, though it can be a bit pedantic, uh, philosophers will distinguish between happiness, which will connote something perhaps rather more cerebral, and pleasure, which is uh, erotic and more sensual and rather, rather base. Uh, and I confess, my original manifesto back in 1995, why did I call it the hedonistic imperative? I, with, with this kind of overtone, unfortunately, of hedonism as something one-dimensional, shallow, and amoral. It was a it was a snappy title, but I think the point is that so master mar marketing purposes. No. <laughs> I don't normally no. think like a, a marketer or a branding <laughs> specialist, but if I called it the moral imperative to use biotechnology yeah, yeah, yeah. to no, no, out suffering, ho hum. I mean, you Sorry can call it the, the, the biohappiness 
revolution or something like that, perhaps. But no, the hedonistic imperative. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, but I think the point is, people will will in future be able to choose what kind of well-being they uh, they enjoy. I mean, I'm something of a crashing prude, and you know, Mill's higher pleasures and so mm -hmm. on. But if someone's conception of pleasure is much uh, earthier and sensual, that will be fine. Mm -hmm. If your conception of uh, of, of the good is, is more intellectual, serene, yeah, or let's say you can uh, choose between serene bliss and mm -hmm. gradients of hyper motivation. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the idea is that I mean, obviously, I can outline my own you know, conception of, of paradise, but by focusing on hedonic uplift, of, of recalibration of your reward circuitry. It's not a case of anyone needing to buy into my or any other transhumanist version of paradise. Mm -hmm. uh, it, essentially, it just enables you to ideally enjoy the kind of life you would like to if you weren't constrained by I was going to say dysfunctional reward circuitry. It may be good for our genes mm -hmm. uh, to be, you know, jealous, envious, discontented, all the kind of the vices of Darwinian psychology. But mm -hmm. of course, it's often not so good for us. So the point here is that um, there's there are cases, you know, where people enjoy uh, different pleasures. Let's mm. say super rich rock stars, for instance, mm. and uh, suddenly because of you know they have access to. Uh, trips through drugs and um, sex, alcohol, you know, good food, traveling. There is cases where these people uh, commit suicide because they are just uh, empty or meaningless. Mm -hmm. What is your conception of meaning in life? Do we have? Uh, do we search for a meaning in life, or you discard this uh, this idea? I think one can talk about meaning in two senses. One, there is the purely empirical sense, mm -hmm. uh, as one's life may feel empty, uh, or one's life may feel packed with meaning and significance. And then there is the possible transcendental sense, that there is perhaps some divine or spiritual purpose. Mm -hmm. uh, I personally, I don't see any evidence, or at least I haven't been able to find any evidence of any kind of transcendent purpose mm -hmm. but nonetheless meaning in the empirical sense I think it's going to be possible to engineer extreme meaning and significance now a lot of people would distinguish between lives that are meaningful and lives that are pleasurable mm -hmm. but other things being equal as one becomes happier one's life becomes more charged with meaning and significance and that by ratcheting up hedonic range and hedonic set points, mm -hmm. our lives are going to become more charged with meaning and significance. Uh, sadly today, as people, if people become uh, uh, depressed, their lives can start to feel empty, meaningless, and this can shade into outright nihilism and suicidal mm -hmm. despair. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah, rather than trying to tell anyone uh, what is the meaning of life, I think one should enable people to have a biology such that life, their lives, naturally mm -hmm. feel meaningful, ideally even super meaningful, mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, allow them to, to, to flourish. Mm -hmm. So it's very interesting because what you're saying is uh, we should aim for universal happiness in, in the sense where everyone in this world, including animals, are happy. Let's, yes. let's say a, a, an earthly paradise, let's yeah. put it that way. Um, but one of the of my concerns is that competition and Darwinian evolution is based also on resource uh, scarcity, scarcity mm -hmm. of resources, which is a real thing. How do you uh, uh, how do you settle with this idea of pleasurable lives? You know, everyone happy with resource scarcity, which will necess necessarily or inevitably inevitably drive uh, competition, and competition can be nasty. So, do you assume at some point that we will have endless uh, amount of resources? How do we cope with this pleasure, uh, universal pleasure and resource uh, scarcity of resources? Well, one thing that doesn't need to be rationed is the substrates of pleasure and mm -hmm. well-being. Uh, indeed, any form of information-based technology, and this is not a point original to me, the price trends inexorably to zero, which is why essentially everyone in the world can have 
a mobile phone. Everyone can, in principle, have a, uh, a music collection as large as Bill Gates. Mm -hmm. And there are, sure, there are always going to be some forms of scarcity, so-called status goods or positional goods. Mm -hmm. Only a finite, a small number of people can own old, original old masters, for mm -hmm. example. But in terms of access to the technology and above all access to the information that allows you, for instance, to choose the genetic makeup of your future child, the kind of uh, the hedonic dial settings, the price is going to come crashing down. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, I don't want to downplay the importance of social reform and injustice. But nonetheless, the nature of digital technology and the information revolution mm -hmm. is, yeah, that many conventional forms of scarcity are going to, to, to disappear. But I'm talking about, for example, scarcity of uh, food, mm. uh, which is, you know, it, it is a real problem, at least in the distribution, you know. Um, still people that want to live pleasurable lives, they'll have to fulfill biological needs or, you know, nutritional needs. And think of the bottom of the pyramid, of the population pyramid, about the, the poorest, the two billion. How do you cope with that? Yes, I think, I don't know precisely what year it, it was uh, announced that, the, that obesity became a greater uh, problem mm -hmm. than, uh, than, than undernutrition. Mm -hmm. And uh, one needs to choose one's words very carefully here because there are certainly people in the world who don't get enough to eat and mm -hmm. more commonly are actually malnourished. Um, but if we're prepared to pursue a twin track approach of yeah, using advanced technology and social reform, something like universal basic income, mm -hmm. then one can claw up absolutely everyone, and I very much hope uh, non-human animals too, via uh, cultured meat technology. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, there is a danger, this is my main worry, that this sounds uh, socially complacent because it's all very well people in the first world, affluent people, saying the problem of material scarcity has been solved because they've got their home and their car and the rest of it. Mm -hmm. um, sadly, there are people even in the first world, let's just look at San Francisco, yeah, who yeah, don't yeah. get mm -hmm. adequate nutrition, who don't have adequate accommodation. Mm -hmm. but. Back to the hedonic treadmill again, it is ultimately an illusion to think above an absolute bare minimum that increase, increasing material affluence is going to make a, a non-negligible difference to well-being. Mm -hmm. If we want to create a world in which all sentient beings can flourish and can be happy, one needs to tackle the biological genetic roots of the problem. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, there's, there's, there's short term, medium and, and long term. Yeah. You don't tell someone whose house is on fire or whose kid has got malaria that they need to be recalibrating their hedonic treadmill. But equally, uh, if one is looking ahead later this century, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, genetic engineering can benefit the, uh, the poorest people as well as the richest. Mm -hmm. My concern is with the process. So, although I think the aims are mm, interesting and you know supportable my concerns are with the process what dangers do you see in this gene tinkering and in using of drugs uh, what could what things could possibly go wrong in this process all kinds of things could go wrong right? it's if you look at the history of utopian schemes mm -hmm. uh, it's it's really sobering um, but I think the point to stress is that if you choose to have children, essentially you're embarking on a unique and untested genetic experiment. So it's not a case of, uh, uh, you know, on the one hand there is this caution and safety and the other is madcap genetic experimentation. Mm -hmm. It's if one is prepared, if one intends to bring more inevitably suffering as well as joy into the world by having children, one needs to take a decision. Am I going to just throw the genetic dice in the traditional way and hope that the outcome is favourable, knowing that, yeah, one's kid may have a terrible physical or psychological disease, may experience all kinds of pain and suffering and misery, 
or is one prepared to load the genetic dice? Already we know, you know, particular genes, alleles associated with either high or low pain sensitivity or a high or a low hedonic set point. Mm -hmm. And rather than tell you that, yeah, everything is going to be wonderful, I mean, I think eventually it will be wonderful, but that's maybe centuries ahead. Um, so there's a, there's a sense of uh, historical determinism in, in, in that sense that you assume that this will happen yes or yes. I am, in some ways, I am a, uh, yes, a technological determinist mm -hmm. that uh, the, the kinds of technologies transhumanists explore, whether mood enrichment or radical life extension, once they become available, I see their long-term adoption is inevitable. Mm -hmm. I mean, today, for example, if you ask people, would you want to live indefinitely, many people would say, no, I would get uh, uh, bored, for example. Mm -hmm. But as one sees if some something is relatively trivial as an anti-wrinkle pro, uh, uh, potion is uh, devised and how it's swept off the shelves, if the uh, yeah, if the technology, whether it's uh, 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 drug therapy or gene therapy, mm -hmm. is developed, it's going to get used. That sure, we have all manner of rationalizations mm -hmm. saying that well, yes, I'm glad I have uh, suffered. I'm glad I lost my legs in the accident because I wouldn't have written the novel, or I'm glad I'm going to grow old, you know, and, and, and so forth. Nonetheless, these are rationalizations. Mm -hmm. And once technology uh, offers the opportunity to lead happy, flourishing, indefinitely youthful, and perhaps a super intelligent life, mm -hmm. most people are going to uh, adopt that technology. But people, I think critically, and this is something worth stressing, that it's it's something people should be free to choose. At the moment, aging is coercive. At the moment, something like low mood and anxiety disorders sadly are coercive, whereas in future they're going to be optional. Mm -hmm. But yeah, no one is going to force, well, not, not sociologically plausible, no one is going to force you to be uh, happy, no one is going to force you to take radical uh, anti-aging supplements mm -hmm. but yeah the opportunity is going to become available um doesn't this bring any um concerns to you in the sense where you say no one will be obliged but we have seen that in many cases throughout history the ends have justified the means and sometimes let's say nazism you know and eugenics doesn't this bring any alarm to you these uh the possibility of that these ends will justify any means at the end. Yes, I mean there is this sobering example of uh, national socialism, race hygiene policy, mm -hmm. uh, culminating in the horrors of the of, of the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. But uh, at the risk of stating the obvious, the goal of national socialism was not the well-being of all sentience. Um, and even if one is a utilitarian rather classical or negative. Being a negative utilitarian is quite consistent with enshrining in law the sanctity of life, um, which I'm not using this in a theological sense necessarily, mm -hmm. but uh, essentially uh, 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 um, that even if, for example, one might think that someone's quality of life uh, is so poor they would be better off not existing, nonetheless the idea of involuntary euthanasia or any lack of respect for people's uh, in, uh, bodily integrity and so mm -hmm. on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there need to be rigorous, rigorous safeguards. And so, yes, uh, I, you know, uh, uh, the uh, the Hippocratic Oath, for example, for, for doctors, the need the, the need to be tremendous safeguards. Mm -hmm. And uh, yes, so as, 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 as the controversy over CRISPR babies uh, shows at the moment, uh, yes. Uh, uh, if if you know you have a child with a terrible disorder, or your child ends up in casualty or something, this is well that these things happen. But mm -hmm. with power comes complicity, whether you you like it or not, and the ability to choose whether to bring 
more suffering into the world. Uh, essentially, biotechnology turns the level of suffering in the biosphere into an adjustable parameter, mm -hmm. not just for, for humans, but non-human, non-humans too. And it's, yeah, it's a very uncomfortable complicity too, because the, the, at least with current understanding and expertise, there are, there are no guarantees. Let's mm -hmm. say you have a, a child with an extremely high pain threshold, will that child take more risks and come to and, and damage him or herself? Mm -hmm. Whereas now, as I said, uh, it's just regarded as an unlucky accident. One can imagine a uh, hysterical mother screaming, evil scientist murdered my baby because my kid had a high pain threshold or something. Um, yeah, I, um, as, as well as the good stuff, I see all manner of problems, tragedies and conflict. But stepping back, we've had, I don't know how many years precisely, 540 million years of pain, misery, discontent and suffering. Um, if we have, if we want to implement this ancient, utopian, Buddhist, whatever you're going to call it, mm -hmm. goal of phasing out suffering, we need to tackle its biological genetic roots. Mm -hmm. And so any of your listeners, your audience are thinking, yes, but what about the risks, the dangers? I completely, I think the, the risks, the pitfalls should be exhaustively exhaustingly researched mm -hmm. but at the end of the day yeah if, if we want to phase out the horrors of Darwinian life involuntary suffering uh, depression uh, yeah we're gonna actually have to edit our genetic source code it's the only way I know to do it mm -hmm. um, you say that nothing that occurs in nature is unnatural you know that let's say for example technology itself materials developed by people the fact that we can play with our genes, that would not be unnatural because it's within nature. Yeah. And if, if the aim of tinkering with all these things is to achieve pleasure and happiness, it's, it's morally right to yeah. do so. Um, what about, for example, cases of pedophilia and zoophilia? People will argue, you know, it's within nature, uh, it brings us pleasure. No one could dispute that it could bring pleasure also to a child or to an animal. How do you deal with that? It's also part of nature. These are cases that happen. Um, well, this, in the case of something like uh, um, paedophilia, for example, you were, you were saying, I mean, this is it. Humans are not uh, bonobos. And at the moment, uh, if anyone chooses to have a child, uh, uh, their, essentially their sexual orientation, it's it's a gamble uh, and one of the moral dilemmas we're going to face in future is should we continue to leave sexual orientation a gamble or should we uh, choose on behalf of our future children their sexual orientation mm -hmm. now many people are very uncomfortable with this idea um, one might imagine... Do you, know, you understand why would this be so? I, I would understand, but equally, uh, this is it. You're not doing uh, a kid any favours if the kid ends up as a, as a, as a future paedophile uh, mm -hmm. uh, or, 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 or something like that. The risk, of course, is that yeah, something like uh, homosexuality, being gay, which until quite recently and still in parts of the world is uh, condemned, mm -hmm. Maybe it is, is still rampant that if uh, sexual orientation is chosen, this will lead to uh, essentially, you know, a continuation of prejudice. I mean, it's, it, this is a, a sort of an example of a, of, of, of a pitfall. But um, but back to your original point. Um, uh, uh, yeah, nature contains all kinds of behaviour which one may approve of or disapprove of, but simply saying X, Y or Z is unnatural isn't by itself an objection. After all, clothes are unnatural, an iPhone is, 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 is unnatural. I think one needs to look at the behaviour and, and thinks, why do we think it is good or bad? If it causes either the subject or uh, whoever the subject interacts with suffering, uh, uh, then other things being equal, it is bad. But if it isn't intrinsically harmful like that, then uh, I can't see any objection. So th that's very interesting. You, you wouldn't contend that these two cases would be morally ob objectionable at some point in the future. Um, 
I mean, as I said, I'm not going to pass a judgment on pygmy chimpanzees because some of their behaviour, if it were practised in humans, would be extremely mm -hmm. problematic. It's mm -hmm. uh, uh, that bonobos, yeah. Um, my yeah, my personal focus is always on, uh, yeah, is this actually helping or harming someone, either directly or indirectly, that simply because something is sacred or... Mm -hmm. Or, or a taboo, uh, it doesn't by itself tell in favour or against it. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You said that uh, Darwinian evolution has been a, you know, a horrible thing in the sense that it has given us pain in, in many, many ways. You know, we, are, we have to struggle with pain mm -hmm. and suffering. Don't these uh, two things play an important role also in human happiness? Like, it is good that we can rationalise our past suffering. Uh, the real challenge comes when the suffering becomes optional. Now, when I mean the opportunity to ratchet up hedonic set points and increase motivation doesn't mean that one will need to abolish any form of struggle. Mm -hmm. But nonetheless, the nasty raw feels of pain and suffering as we experience today are going to become optional and I mean, people say well what about uh, art and great literature and that without pain and suffering isn't this going to abolish uh, rich aesthetic experiences and yeah there are two things here first dare one say it that our smart machines AI are going to be producing artistic products of an excellence that s surpasses that of mere humans uh, today mm -hmm. And another, but the other uh, approach is that by, uh, yeah, essentially uh, exploring the molecular signature of aesthetic experience, perhaps spiritual experience in mm -hmm. CNS, it's going to be possible to, to massively amplify and enrich and purify this too. Um, so I don't think anyone need uh, fear uh, giving up something they value. But equally, I, I don't think, uh, yeah, that, that people should be yet yeah, just forced to suffer against their will um, as they are today. Do you think are, at this point we're still in, let's say, the speculative uh, area or science fiction? Do you look at it as more factual kind of? Where, where do you think this is at the current time? I mean, back speculative in speculative or factual. <laughs> Back in 1995, when I wrote the imperative, something the, the human genome hadn't been decoded, gene drives weren't understood, cultured meat was something belonging to sci-fi. Now we're on the brink of a cultured meat revolution. We've just had the first CRISPR babies. Um, yeah, I mean, you'll wake up tomorrow, life goes on as before, and a lot of these ideas will sound crazy. But uh, looking ahead 5, 10, 15, let alone 25 and 30 years, mm -hmm. yeah, essentially the revolution is, is coming. Uh, and yeah, I, th I think life could in principle be absolutely wonderful, even uh, sublime, but we're going to have to work incredibly hard to make it so. Would that, would that come at the price of um, destroying the human uh, being? human homo sapiens because homo sapiens in its current state is incompatible to with what with what you are um, asking for what you're searching for it essentially uh, this project involves changing human, human nature, nature original uh, original sin that all kinds of unpleasant uh, behavior are extremely genetically adaptive that's why they've evolved one only has to look at human history or look back on the last century where humans killed I don't know perhaps a hundred million members of their own species and billions more of innocent sentient beings yes this this project uh, is changing transforming human nature but in, in, in a good way I, I don't see that people are going to need to give up anything that uh, they rightfully value mm -hmm. well um, Jamie, thank you very much. It has been very, very interesting. And, uh, well, any final words to my audience in Latin America? 
Oh, thank you very much indeed, Mikos. It's been a great pleasure, and I look forward to uh, returning to Peru and catching up with you and some of your. Uh, well, <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.